Thank you so much for coming. So the way I would like to introduce what I do is just think about the rotating planet that we live on. For almost a billion years, this has been rotating, and almost every life form on this planet evolved on this rotating planet. So with every rotation, with every day, there is a cycle of light and darkness. And if you think of the source of all energy on this planet, source of all food on this planet comes from light. We all have built up a circadian clock or a 24-hour clock to anticipate when the sun comes up and when it goes down. And if we don't know what a circadian clock is, then just think about babies. When babies are born, actually, they don't have a strong clock. So they go to sleep and then wake up and cry, then go back to sleep and wake up and cry. They do that almost in every three to four hours. So just imagine, if we all didn't have a clock, then half of you would be sleeping, half would be crying. <laughs> but then what happens is after a few weeks, babies actually pick up a clock and sanity comes to life and they, if you're lucky, they sleep for a few hours, eight to 10 hours, and then they stay awake. But what is interesting is, outside the equator, almost every other places, with the change in season, the light-dark cycle also changes. So that means this clock should also track when sun comes up in different season. So in addition to all of this, actually our body clock does a lot of different things. For example, if you went to bed last night around, say, 10 o'clock, then your deepest sleep happened around 2 o'clock. And the body actually, the clock anticipates when to wake up. So the body warms up slightly even before your alarm clock goes up. And then at 6 or 7, if you woke up, then your melatonin level, which is the sleep hormone, it begins to drop and your stress hormone begins to rise because that's when the perceived humans started to run to grab some food and eat. So the best alertness is around morning time. So if you fall asleep during my talk, you can blame it on your clock. <laughs> and then towards the afternoon, if you think about it, the pre-civilized humans had to run back from outside to get, to get home or find shelter. So similar, so accordingly, our clock actually tells our muscle to be most active in the late afternoon. And in fact, that's the best time to exercise because the injury is less. And then melatonin level rises, you fall asleep, and then the body cools down, and that helps us sleep. And so as I, as I said, for all this clock to, to work perfectly in different season, we also have to train our clock to light. What was surprising was, for a very long time, we didn't know how clock receives light. And that's why we went back to mice. And little mice also have a clock, just like us. The only difference is mice are nocturnal, so they sleep during the day, and they're awake during nighttime. So all these processes happen, but they're just flipped. What was interesting was, almost 100 years ago, there was a graduate PhD student in Harvard. He had some blind mice, and he figured out that although these mice could not read and could not see stuff, they could actually constrict their pupil when bright light was there. So they could constrict their pupil, and subsequently in the next 40 to 50 years, people also figured out that these blind mice can respond to light, so they will entrain their clock to light-dark cycle, and we know that light suppresses sleep. We cannot fall asleep in a lighted room. So similarly, mice fall asleep in a lighted room because they're nocturnal. So all of these things that happens in response to light that we took for granted was actually happening in a blind mouse. So that was very curious because we knew so much about how we see, but we did not know what is this missing light receptor in the eye. So almost 12, 13 years ago, when I was a postdoc, I was, work, I was beginning my research into um, mammals or mouse. During that time, we discovered a new light receptor in our eye. And this was really a big discovery in our field because for 100 years, people are looking for this missing light receptor. And this light receptor is present only in few thousand cells. For example, 
Our eye has 15 million rod and cones that give us this vision, but there are only, uh, this light receptor is present only in 5,000 cells. And we call it melanopsin, and it actually helps us to stay awake during the daytime, and um, also the absence of light helps us to fall asleep at night. So how do we figure out that this is the light receptor? So we actually had a mouse that did not have this light receptor. And what you're looking at here is during daytime, the mouse sleeps and then wakes up and be active. So that's what you're seeing here. And then it does it, and the activity is mostly at the nighttime. So now imagine if we fly the mouse from here to Beijing, 12 hours light dark cycle change, then the mouse takes six to seven days of jet lag to readjust to that new light dark cycle. But if you have a mouse that can clearly see everything is fine, the only thing that's missing is this new light receptor that we discovered, then if you fly this mouse from here to Beijing, it takes almost a month to readjust. And that was really, really exciting because this mouse can see, but it cannot sense light to reset its clock. So subsequently, what we have done is we actually can label these uh, cells very nicely with uh, modern molecular biology techniques. So you see those cells, and they light up very nicely, and they send what we call axons. So these are wires that go into the brain. So now we can follow these wires and see where do these wires go. And what is interesting is when we follow them, we find that they go to the base of the brain called hypothalamus, and there are these two tiny centers and that's where we knew that there are 10,000 cells, only 10,000 cells out of billions of cells in our body, only these 10,000 cells have clock. And these master clocks actually regulate our sleep-wake cycle. So we found a direct connection from this light sensor to the clock. And next, if we follow these fibers, just like that magic school bus story, then we actually reach another part of the brain that constricts our pupil. So, so, for example, if you go out to the courtyard, your pupil will constrict, and these cells regulate that. Now, along the same route, if we go back a little bit, then we see that another part of the brain also lights up. And this part of the brain actually helps us to see brightness. For example, when you're watching TV, you change the brightness level, and that's sensed by the same cells. But if you tune it too much, then what happens is there are these tiny fibers that go deep into the brain, and those are actually the same cells that sense light and make us uncomfortable. So some of you who might go to the beach and spend three to four hours may come back with a headache or migraine pain. So these same cells that sense excessive light and can trigger migraine. So in general, what this discovery led us to understand is this light sensor is most sensitive to blue spectrum of light. And sunlight is very rich in blue light, but indoor light, for example, right now where I'm standing, there is very little blue light. So, the, so what happens is most of our indoor lighting is very poor in blue light. So if we're indoor almost throughout the day and night, then we don't get that blue light that resets our clock, makes us happy, and we can tend to become depressed. Another thing is these cells a very less sensitive to light. So that means we need a lot of light to actually activate these brain centers. For example, in a typical office room without windows, you may have 100 to 200 lux of light. That's enough to do your task, but it's not enough to activate these sensors, enough so that you feel happy and a lot. And at night time, they can actually integrate light over time. So that means even if there is dim light, it will actually count how many photons are coming in and can keep you awake. So that's why some of you may find it very difficult to fall asleep, even if there is little light in the, in the room. So now this discovery is also leading to now think about light in a very different way. We are actually working with engineers and standard uh, setters who are trying to figure out how to set design standard to have enough light during daytime and also give freedom to people so that they can sleep in a dark room. What we have lost in modern life is our right to darkness, and that's what we are bringing up. So now let's switch gear and think about bigger health issue. If I was born in the year 1900, then my life expectancy would have been only 47 years, and only one in 100 
lived up to the age of 90 years. One third of all babies died before the age of five, and that led to the idea that the leading cause of death was infectious disease, or microbes or bogs were actually the culprit. So sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics saved life. In fact, Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine, at that time there are 50,000 new cases of polio every year in the US. And just after vaccination, five years of vaccination, the number of new polio dropped down to 100. So imagine what a huge impact it had. But now, in 2010, an average human, who is, uh, average baby who is born will uh, live up to 79 years, one in four may live up to 90 years. But the problem is, although we extend that lifespan, we haven't actually been successful in extending health span, staying healthy. For example, one third of all adults beyond the age of 21 suffer from at least one chronic disease. That means it can be obesity, uh, fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, etc. And 80% of elders 65 years or older have multiple chronic disease. And what we are understanding now is lifestyle contributes to disease risk. And the cure is very rare. It's very rare to see an insulin-dependent type 2 diabetic becoming normal. So now we've got to figure out what is lifestyle and how we can change it. When you think of lifestyle, we often think it's what and how much. We do certain things, eat, drink, sleep, move around, something like that. But what we're finding is lifestyle is also what, when, and how much we eat, sleep, and move around. I'll get to that shortly. So what we found in the last few years, um, it's not only discoveries from our lab, many labs have contributed to the discovery, that just like in the brain, almost every organ in our body has clocks. Even our hair follicles also have clocks. And that help us to time different things to different time of the day. For example, just imagine your hair follicle actually Every evening, our hair follicle repairs itself. So that's why you'll never see a hair cancer because there is a strong clock, and that repairs it. So similarly, our liver is very good in metabolizing sugar in the first half of the day, but it's not that good in the second half or in the evening. So almost every organ has clock. So how do we figure out that what is the importance of this clock? What we knew was when the clocks don't work properly, then we get disease. And this happens in at least two different cases. One is when we eat unhealthy food, for example, high fat, fatty food, or when we, as we get older, our clocks actually weaken. So we got to figure out how to strengthen our clock. So this is an example that has been done almost 10, 15,000 times around the world. What people do is they take identical set of mice, and one set of mouse eats healthy diet, and then the other set of mouse gets high fat diet. So they get around 60% of calories from fat, which is equivalent to eating only ice cream, nachos, and cheese all the time. And what happens is after nine weeks, that mouse becomes fat, and that led to the idea that high fat diet causes obesity, diabetes, because these mice also become obese, diabetic. They also have high cholesterol, high insulin, they get cardiovascular disease, and if you have a faulty gene, then these, these mice will also get dementia very quickly. But then we asked, well, let's see when do these mice eat. Mice on normal diet, they eat most of their food during nighttime because they're nocturnal. Mice on high fat diet, surprisingly, they split their calorie and then eat throughout day and night. And as a consequence, what happens is mice on normal chow, they have a very strong clock, and mice on high fat diet have a very faulty clock. We asked, how can we actually change the clock here without giving them a medication or without introducing a gene or something else? So now we took two identical set of mice. One set of mice ate whenever they want. And then the other set of mice was given access to food only for 8 to 12 hours every night. And mice are very smart. If they realize that food is available only for 8 to 10 hours, then they will, take, they will eat all of that daily caloric intake within that eight hours. So both sets of mice now eat same number of calories, and we measure them almost every week. We also measure their body weight, and we did this experiment for almost 18 weeks, which is equivalent to almost 15 years in human life. 
So after 18 weeks, this mouse is obese as expected, but surprisingly, this mouse that ate the same calorie and the same type of food was lean. In fact, this mouse was 28% leaner and had 70% less body fat. Now, if we now do pathology on this mice, take out little past part of liver, the mice that eat high fat diet whenever they want, that is ad libitum, they have fatty liver disease. And in fact, one in three adults in the US uh, suffer from fatty liver disease and we don't even know. And that predisposes us to many different diseases. And mice that had the same fatty diet, but within eight to 10 hours, the liver was looking pretty good. And in fact, you cannot figure out whether this liver is different from mice that ate healthy diet. So we did a few other tests, and what we found is this time-restricted feeding, where the calorie is not restricted, but the time is defined, that led to reduced cholesterol, reduced sugar, reduced body fat, normal body weight. They spent more energy, they had better motor control, and endurance, and I'll get to that. So we published this paper saying, well, if mice eat for eight hours, then they stay healthy. But then the question was, well, can we take a fat mouse and shrink the mouse? And second is, is eight hours or 10 hours a magic number? What if we give mice food for 12 hours, 15 hours, where should we stop? And if the mice actually ate for eight hours for half of their life, and then they switched to our libitum, will they become fat? And we asked, well, we actually don't eat 60% high fat diet. What we eat in the US is mostly high fructose, high fat, moderate fat. So what about all this fat? So now I'll give you a little bit of science talk. So forget about all these uh, complex uh, figures. So the bottom line is what we did, we took mice and then gave them different kind of diet, high fat, high fructose. They got the food for nine hours, 15 hours, 12 hours. And then sometimes they got the food only for nine hours during the weekday. Weekend, they could chow whatever they want, whenever they want. <laughs> and then we fatten up the mice and then put them on time restricted feeding, all these kinds of experiments. And in every experiment, we made sure that all these groups of mice are eating the same number of calories from the same food. The only thing that we're changing was timing. And that's what is shown here. All these groups, they ate similar amount of calorie. And in fact, the mice that ate five days of time restricted, two days of ad lib, uh, gorging. They actually eat more than the control mice. They eat extra food. But what is surprising is, after several weeks, when we put these mice on a special scale that measures their total body weight, fat, lean mass, water, and everything, then invariably, whatever diet they are on, if they eat for somewhere between nine to 12 hours, even five days of time restricted, they have less body weight, and they also have less fat. So the red portion here is fat. And what we found is, irrespective of what, whatever diet they're eating, if they eat for nine to 12 hours, then they're healthy. 15 hours was not so healthy. What if the mice become fat first, and then we transport them to nine hour diet, then they lost body weight. If they were eating for nine hours, and then we made them free to eat whenever they want, they also became fat. Mice that ate only healthy diet, the body weight did not change, but what is interesting is they gain more lean mass or muscle mass if they eat only for nine to 12 hours every day. So irrespective of diet type, they had benefit. Then we asked, how is the muscle strength? Because you, know, you want to be healthy, you should have good muscles. If we put these mice to lift weight, that's what this is, we don't see any difference in weight lifting. But if we put these mice on a treadmill, then mice will run on treadmill for 40 to 75 minutes, and mice that ate only for nine hours, they actually run on treadmill for almost twice long. And this was surprising. What was, uh, we never expected that they would actually improve their performance, but this was surprising, and we find that all the time. But what is surprising is they get this endurance benefit only when they eat nine hours or eight hours. If they eat for 12 to 15 hours, they don't get that extra benefit in endurance. So now, next we uh, publish this paper that if you take a fat mouse and it eats for limited hours, it becomes lean. If you take a lean mouse, eats whenever they want, then they become fat. So that's easy to remember. So now we thought, well, 
uh, let's go and try a different organism. And we also do experiments on fruit flies. So we took fruit flies and gave fruit flies um, independence to eat whenever they want, or they got to eat only for 12 hours. And then we did the health checkup and every two weeks. And what was surprising was, this is how a baby fruit fly sleeps. It sleeps very well uh, throughout the night because fruit flies are diurnal. And in the morning and evening, they eat a very big meal. And in the daytime, they have a little siesta, just like human babies do. But as the fruit flies become older, if they eat whenever they want, then the sleep becomes really bad. In nighttime, they go to bed, but then after a few hours, they wake up. They cannot go back to sleep. In daytime, they're sleepy. But they, if they eat only for 12 hours, although they're eating the same number of calories, they sleep very well throughout the night, and throughout the day, they are much more awake. But that's not the big thing we're looking after. We, we actually wanted to see how their heart performs. And fruit flies do have heart, not like us, but they have a tube-like structure. And this heart actually beats very well. And we can take a microscope, put a video camera, and we can see the beating fruit fly heart. And we can now do something what we call image analysis, where we can see that there are uh, seven different parameters of heart function that are also tested in humans. So we know that as we is, just like uh, fruit flies, these seven parameters change. So our systolic diameter, diastolic diameter, all of these uh, things change, and our heart becomes more arrhythmic. But we wanted to test what happens to fruit flies that eat only for 12 hours. So I showed you the baseline of three-week-old fruit fly, and by five weeks old, if the fly was eating whenever it wanted, then it has a lot of arrhythmicity. Flies live only for seven weeks, so these are kind of uh, late is a little bit older flies. If this fruit fly is at only for 12 hours, then you can see how the heart is. It's pretty rhythmic. So that was profound, and we have done this experiment again and again, and we can actually take an older fruit fly, put it on 12 hours diet, and its heart becomes slightly better. So now, if we combine the mouse and fruit fly experiment, what we see is the eating time interval has a huge benefit on blood cholesterol, blood sugar, body weight, body fat, inflammation, so for example, joint pain, et cetera, and stomach health, that's dysbiosis, and sleep, cardiac function, endurance, et cetera. So what about humans? Well, if we, we know that all of these things happen at specific time of the day, but we humans, we wake up to an alarm clock, then we grab a cup of coffee, then we're rushing out of the door to get to work, and on the way, we grab some breakfast, we reach work, and then somebody brings some cake or a cookie from home. So we have a snack, then we have our lunch, then we go to a meeting, we have coffee and cookies, so we keep on eating. So we wanted to see when actually people eat. What is interesting is, in nutrition science, people always ask, when do you have breakfast, when do you have lunch, when do you have dinner? But nobody asks uh, very specifically, tell me everything that you eat throughout the day. And one problem is we can't remember everything that we eat because we eat different things on different days. So what we did, we made a smartphone app where people have to just take a picture of what they eat. They don't have to say what they eat. Let's take a picture and press save button, it will come to our server, and we'll figure out what you ate. We have all the records. So we did this for three weeks from some San Diego adults, so we had nearly 150 people in this. And people are not very shy about what they ate. They took picture of almost everything. You can see all kinds of beer and all water here, a little bit handful of nuts somewhere, a little bit of cheese. So they were not shy. So what we found was, now the question is, how do we show this data in a different way? So we call it a pedogram. So that means we bring all those pictures and then line them up on a timeline. And we did this for three weeks. So every hash mark here is essentially what, whether the person ate something other than water. Um, and if you look at this, you, you can see that this person actually ate very randomly throughout day and night. And this was weekday and weekend. So now, again, how do we make sense of all of this data? Now we put all of them together and we ask, okay, so this is how the person kind of eats during weekdays and that's during the weekend. 
And so here, the fasting duration, for example, was six hours during the weekdays and eight hours during the weekend. And we can figure out what is the eating duration. So that's the breakfast to last bite. That was around 18 hours for this person during the weekday, which we know in mice is pretty bad, and 16 hours in the weekend. And just like when we travel to a new place, we get jet lag, our stomach also gets jet lag when we change our breakfast time in the weekday, weekend. So this person had a jet lag of, or metabolic jet lag of four hours. What is interesting is when we ask these people, when do we eat, almost invariably everybody says, we eat for 12 hours. Because they will think when they had their breakfast and when they had their dinner, but what is interesting is they ignore the coffee. They ignore the late night snack or a glass of wine. But we know that every single calorie or every single coffee does matter because they impact our clock. Or just imagine the coffee is not going and sitting in the stomach until the breakfast comes. The stomach gets up and starts processing that coffee, sending it to liver, liver sends it to brain, and that's how we wake up. So now, that was one person's data. And how, do this, how does this data look for 150 people? Now we put them on a circle, and that's 6 a.m., that's 9 a.m., that's noon, and every concentric circle is data from one person. What you can see is almost most of the people wake up around somewhere between 6 to 9, start eating, and this is three weeks of data, and people do it. Um, uh, they lunch around noon and dinner around, say, 7 or 8, but then they continue eating the small meals and snacks, sometimes some of them theoretically. <laughs> Now, if we ask what is the average number of calories per picture, then we do see, as expected, there is slight increase here, slight increase there. But then the midnight snacks are actually more dense in calories. The reason is, actually, what we eat in midnight, so the blue are the ones that we eat during daytime, for example, coffee in the morning, very little coffee at night. But if you think of alcohol, that's pretty high in the night. And then there is ice cream, high in night. So that explains why our late night calorie intake is so high. If you think of spicy food, that goes with lunch and dinner. But when sweets, it just starts in the morning and goes all the way till bedtime. <laughs> so now, just like in mice, now we knew that, okay, so in mice, if they eat for 12 hours or so, they're healthy. For how many hours these people are actually eating? What we find is 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or longer. And that's pretty scary because we know that that if sustained over a lifetime, can actually make us unhealthy. We also had another question that, how do people eat between weekdays and weekend? So we gave them a little watch that I'm wearing so that we can monitor their sleep-wake cycle, and then we can figure out uh, what is their weekday, weekend and weekday eating pattern. The bottom line is almost 40% of adults delay their breakfast by one hour, and then 25% delay our breakfast by two hours. The dinner is very random. Another thing that we asked is, we know that grandma said we should eat a big meal in the morning. So we asked, do people actually eat a big meal in the morning? Since we had caloric intake from every single hour, now if we map, what we find is by middle of the day, people eat only less than a quarter of that calorie. By evening, we still have one third of calories to go. In the first three hours of evening, we eat more food than in the first eight hours of the day. So actually, we are following exactly the opposite of conventional wisdom. We, eat, we are now eating more food in the evening. And we know that our body, our clock, tells that we cannot process that much food in the evening. We are much better processing that amount of food in the morning. Now, we also know that what time they went to bed, what time they wake up. So we asked, what do people do? 80% eat or drink something within an hour of waking up, and that's not water. And 50% eat or drink something within two hours before going to bed. So that means as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is also open. <laughs> so now, the, finally what we did, we took, we asked eight people who are eating for 14 hours or longer, and we asked, would you like to do one thing? Try to eat whatever you want to eat within your self-selected 10 to 11 hours. We are not going to tell you how much you should eat or what you should eat, just eat for 10 to 11 hours, and they agreed. And 
we make that pedogram during baseline, what we call three weeks we monitored, and that was nearly 14 to 15 hours. And during the 16 weeks, they actually took picture of all the, means most of the days they took picture of the food. And what we find is they reduce their eating time to 11 hours. And when they do that, then they lost some body weight, they improved their sleep, and they felt more energetic throughout the day. And the effect sustained for one year. It's very difficult to make a sustained change in behavior that stays for up to one year. So this was really interesting. So that was the summary of that part. And then what you can do, what we all can do to extend this study, because that was only eight people, and we monitored only 156 people. So now we have a new app, and we call it the My Circadian Clock. You can go to this website and sign up. So if you go to the website, then it will ask you a few questions to know about yourself. And then after you answer, uh, we actually give you a, what we call informed consent. So that means you consented to participate, and at any time you can also withdraw your consent. Then you can download the app uh, from App Store or Google Play, so it works both on Android and iPhones. And then you can start using the app to log your sleep, uh, food, activity, and sleep every day. So all this data is sent to a secure server, just like your bank uses secure server and encryption. We use exactly the same kind of communication tools. And also, everybody's identity is anonymized, so no one knows except for two or three researchers who are part of the study to know who is who. And we don't share the data. And then every day, one gets a reminder or daily health tips and then periodic reports. And you can also send feedbacks and comments to researchers. And you can also say, no, I don't want to participate anymore. Just take my name off. We also are trying to go beyond this room to tell you about clock and health. So now we have a website where we do have, let me see, um, we have a blog. So you can read more about how biological clock or circadian clock works, and different doctors, different lay people, everybody is writing how it affects their health, et cetera. And outside, as, uh, as you heard, there is a wellness and nutrition booth. There are 12 people from our lab and collaborators, including a famous uh, cardiologist, uh, will be out there to answer your question. And um, we have almost four MD-PhDs here in the areas of circadian clock, vision science, ophthalmology, and gastroenterology. And when you go to that booth, you will also get a body composition analysis on a scale. And usually when you go to a um, fitness center, you have to pay 30 to 50 bucks to get that analysis done. So you can sign up for the app and then get a, um, get a sticker or get a magnet to put on your kitchen. And I'll get to that. So why this is important? Because this is important not only for adults like us. This is also important for young children. I didn't have time to talk about that. What we are saying is when children lose sleep or have erratic eating habit, then they have increased cases of inattention at school, ADSD symptoms can increase poor school performance, and they can get into depression and anxiety. Whereas in adults, when we have a broken clock when, or when we have disrupted sleep or eating pattern, then we get into a lot of different troubles, um, starting from metabolic disease all the way to dementia and memory deficit. So when you go out and if you sign up, you'll get a kitchen magnet like this where hopefully you can go and say what time you should close your kitchen and what time you should turn off your light. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I was just curious when you did the experiments on fruit flies and mice uh, yeah. for, for various durations of time, how do you control the time they are eating? How do you program a fruit fly to eat for 12 hours or only 8 hours? Yeah, so it's very simple. What we do is we transfer them from a vial that has food to a, another vial that only has a little bit of agar to keep the humidity. And within that 12 hours, fruit flies, just like mice, they learn to eat the same number of calories. Yes. Can, 
Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that again? I couldn't. Yeah, you've asked orthogonal questions, who, what, when, where, and why. Very interesting. But the important questions for the person who's not a scientist are how and how much. How do you cut down eating, and what do you eliminate from your diet? You didn't get into that, I don't think, so I'm interested in your comments about that. Yeah. So how we, we can change our diet, um, and how much to eat. Yes. How much to eat is a very important um, point. What is interesting is when we ask these people to reduce the eating interval to 10 to 11 hours. We didn't tell them, change your diet or reduce your calorie. What is interesting is, as you can imagine, if they started somewhere, say, around 9 o'clock in the morning and they're eating only for 10 hours, they go till 7 in the evening, they cut down on their alcohol and dessert. So that reduced the number of calories by up to 20% without them counting every calorie. Second thing is, since they excluded um, this unhealthy food, they also improved their nutrition. So it's a very indirect way to change your nutrition. Um, we are not like mice or fruit flies. We don't pack all of our calories within uh, 10 to 11 hours. When we are asked to eat only for 10 to 11 hours, we also improved nutrition and reduced total calories. Yes. Are you including water or non-caloric uh, beverages in your eating period? Eating period? No, we don't, we don't include water while calculating, so you can drink water whenever you want. Non-calorie beverages, that's very confusing for most people. One is, for example, you drink a black coffee, and as I said, the black coffee is not going and sitting in our stomach. It actually affects our circadian clock. It affects metabolism. It affects how our body responds to energy. It also goes to the brain. That's how we stay awake. And it affects our sleep. So many non-caloric beverages that we think is benign may be taken with moderation because it has other effects. That's why we are drinking it. We often hear that eating small meals during the day is better than large meals. So within that 11 hours, is it more beneficial to eat five small meals or three big meals or two big meals? So those are the questions we want to answer in a large study, like when volunteers come up and record their food. What is happening in mice is mice actually don't eat three large meals. They eat small meals throughout that 8 to 12 hours interval. And um, Yes, small meals are good because of glucose control. That's what the doctors always tell us. But at the same time, the problem for us is it's very difficult to define what is a small meal. It means one, we start eating half a cookie. Sometimes it's very hard to stop there. So <laughs> that's the problem in many cases. Yes. You know, when I hear something like this, I always like to try to see how it measures up to evolution. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, why would, it seems to, that it's healthy to eat when food's available. Why would mother nature make an organism that gets sick when it eats when food's available, if, as long as it's not eating bad food or getting too many calories? Any ideas on that? Yeah, so um, in evolution, we also had access to food at predictable time. For example, if you're in the wild, uh, and if the person is hunting, it's actually much more likely to hunt during twilight time because that's when the animals come to watering hole. And if there was agriculture, then early morning one has to go and pick up the berries and fruits, otherwise the birds will come and eat them. So in that way, if you think about evolution, there was a pressure to eat, to have access to food at a certain time of the day. When it comes to quality of food, if you think a little bit broadly, for example, now dial back, say, 100 years, and we know that the Asians eat more high-carb diet. South of Europe eats slightly um, more, um, say, fruits and vegetables, Mediterranean diet. And then north of Europe eats mostly um, meat and fatty food, cheese, etc. 
But if diet quality actually affects our disease, then you sh we should have seen diabetes being an epidemic in Asia or high fat diet causing fatty liver disease in Europe. We didn't see that because 100 years ago, the grand equalizer was the absence of light. So we are forced to eat all of our food during daytime because it was very expensive to have lights on or to have a refrigerator to store food. Yes. Yes. That's what we did not have in our study, and now we want to follow, because this is a very important question, because in any industrialized country, somewhere between 17 to 20 percent of workforce work in ships. And it's not only them, just imagine their family members. The spouses are waiting for them to come back so that they can eat lunch or dinner together. So their eating pattern, their sleeping pattern is also affected. And now imagine people who are actually non-card-carrying shift worker. What I mean by that is anyone who leaves home, say, around 6 o'clock in the morning or before, and reaches home after 7 p.m., they're also kind of shift workers. And if we include that, then in Europe, 44% of adults are kind of this uh, shift worker. And that's actually a huge problem. And we know that shift work itself predisposes to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain kind of cancer, for example, breast cancer is pretty high. And that's why even World Health Organization has declared circadian rhythm disruption. It's politically incorrect to say shift work is a carcinogen. So uh, it's a huge problem, and we're trying to figure out how to model now shift work in animals first and see how we can do food timing to reduce the health risk. And then we'll go to real humans and test it. Good afternoon, doctor. Um, so I have a question also, I think it's a good follow-up of this one, about uh, we were talking about the jet lag from the weekend eaters and the, and the weekday eaters. Yeah. What, uh, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on this jet lag. OK. So for example, when you, so our brain has a clock, and that brain clock regulates our sleep wake cycle. So when we move, fly from east coast to west coast or vice versa, we experience that change in time, and we're trying to adapt to the local time, and there is a conflict between what our internal time says and what the external time is, and that's why we feel groggy. So similarly, the liver also has a clock, and it regulates metabolism. It's tuned to breakfast time during the weekday. And now in the weekend, when we go eat breakfast at a different time, the liver is almost thinking it's in a different time zone. So it tries to readjust to that new time for two days, and then again we are coming back to Monday, the regular breakfast time. So that causes this timing conflict uh, for those. So that's why we call it kind of social jet lag. Yeah, so for example, what happens is uh, the clock helps us to anticipate food. And that's a huge advantage. That means what happens, our pancreas, our gut, prepares for the arrival of food. So for example, if, if I am eating eight breakfast at 8, around 7 o'clock, my body is expecting that breakfast and is already making all this digestive juice and everything. And if my breakfast doesn't arrive at 8 o'clock, and is delayed up to 10, then that breakfast, when it comes, it doesn't have the same kind of digestive juice and everything else that was present. So we miss that trend. And then in Monday, when I'm changing my breakfast time to 6 a.m., then the food up arrives when the body is not ready. So just imagine, on a on a week-to-week -week basis, it, it won't be a big problem. Just imagine showing up for work 15 minutes late or half an hour late. Uh, once or twice in a week. It doesn't matter, but if we continue to do that when it comes to promotion time, <laughs> that'll be a bad remark. So this small defect in efficiency shows up later in life. Almost like driving a car with a bad timing belt. Will not stop your car for the next 200 miles, but will show up after 2,000 miles. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I know you're talked in talk about the correlation between um, um, generational eating habits, but um, 
the um, is there anything to, with the eating on the regular schedule and then with our generational um, eating habits of, of, you know, family structure. Do you, um, in the sense of that, that we don't eat like we did 50 years ago, you know, yeah. with, you know, at the table at six o'clock at night, does, does, I hope my question made sense. Yeah, so what, you, what we tend to say is, we are kind of in a free-range lifestyle. Um, almost everybody in the family has a different uh, schedule. For example, the kids wake up very early in the morning, and then they have to, we think that they have to eat something before leaving for school, because they may not have breakfast at school. And then we kind of have a different lifestyle. And then at the end of the day, we all come back, and then we think that, okay, so this is the social time, and we should eat together. Or even if we ate at a different time, we say, well, let's go out and have ice cream together. And what it does is it actually lengthens everybody's eating pattern and disrupts everybody's eating pattern. So the social aspect of lifestyle is very interesting these days because every age group lives a different lifestyle. When you put them together under the same roof, then it's very difficult to adapt with each other. So almost everybody, they shift work on a different shift. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it'll be much more ideal to have the same breakfast time every day. Yeah, but uh, is it really the most important thing, or just like to stay in the specific window time, like 10 hours, yes? Oh, we can, yeah. I mean, that, uh, the animals in the wild, they just, uh, they just have a specific window time when the light is on there, right? And that's when they can eat and they are healthy. But uh, we eat whenever we So these are, this, these are the kind of questions we want to answer in a larger studies where we will see whether people who change, who still stay the 10 hours but move that window day or night, what happens to them. So those kind of questions we want to answer in this study.